Wow, aloha. Welcome back to the Think Tech Hawaii studio. It looks like we've got a new intro in my absence. That was pretty cool. Um, I'm sorry I've been out. I had to take some time. I was hiking in the Tetons, and I, I really don't think we were going to get an episode broadcast out of the mountains. Um, back from PSA Tech, it's good to be back in the studio today. Um, uh, I know I had advertised that Kim Lloyd was going to join us from Acres. She cannot be here today um, due to a scheduling thing that came up for her. So we'll look to get her on a future episode. But Jonathan Harris, the amazing Jonathan Harris, has stepped in to save the episode. No pressure, Jonathan. Welcome to the studio. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure. I'm excited uh, to participate. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thanks for jumping in, man. I appreciate it. So last minute. Um, we, uh, Jonathan brought this topic up. We're going to talk about metrics and um, we're going to, I'm going to let him start off with sort of the, some of his background and how I usually, Jonathan's been on a few times. Normally I let my guests give their background and stuff. So if you want to do some of that, please do. Maybe as it relates to this, bring, bring in the metrics forth um, from your pra uh, prior practices would be good. And then um, we'll just kind of bounce into this and then we'll look at it from a, a few perspectives he wants to bring. And then I'd like to bring some of the the broader picture, the end game that some of the D the D Homeland Security looks at for some of their facilities. And uh, we'll kind of play around with this, and I think uh, you'll find it quite interesting. So stick around, gang. Jonathan, thanks again for joining me. Um, I'll let you take over there with just sort of a little bit of your history with uh, the industry and then you know how metrics has come to play a part in the roles that you've had. Excellent. Appreciate it. Thank you. So um, I would recommend anyone who wants kind of my full bio, head to our website um, or uh, my LinkedIn profile uh, for kind of the whole thing. But I'll, but I'll focus in on um, kind of where my maturity through metrics and, and wanting to, to like have them and know them and, and evolve them came from. So I started my career um, in, in uh, security officer training uh, where I was developing training programs for security officers. And a key thing for me was understanding what was working and what wasn't. So we were training them on how to use security systems, how to do certain rounds, um, how to, how to uh, just you know, come from nothing you know, right off the street and be operative, you know, operable and, and, and do what they want to do. So I would track certain things and measure things and trying to figure stuff out. So, you know, kind of an analytical person from the beginning. Um, I moved on to an aerospace and defense company that had a, that had a focus on um, lean and Six Sigma principles and lean operating systems. And so they, uh, my first security management role, they came to me and said, hey, we need your metrics. I'm like, I, well, you know, for what? Like, what? What do you mean? You know, we're, we're security officers. We just make sure nothing bad happens. So I really was resistant to that concept. Mm. Um, and it said, no, we're different. We don't make widgets. We, we can't give you anything to track. You know, we just, we're here making sure things stay safe. And they, they push back. They go, nope, you know, you're a manager now in this company. And in this company, everyone does this and so you need to do it. Um, so I went to the class to learn around the lean manufacturing operating systems. And it was like this aha moment, like, oh, I, we're trying to measure the wrong stuff. And so um, through about eight or nine years with that company, you know, I went through kind of you know, this iteration of really understanding, measuring key processes, mapping out key processes, applying the, the lean um, manufacturing and operation excellence principles and then getting a performance output on things that matter to the business. Um, mm. After that experience and being a, a global security and compliance leader, I went to work for a access control systems manufacturer under the same parent company, um, and they struggled with the same thing. You know, we don't mm. make airplane parts, which is the company I came from. We make access control systems, and it's different. You know, we don't do you know it, the metrics don't do the same thing. Um, or I was in a sales and business development department. Where, and so we said, no, we don't. Yeah, we'll, we'll go get the checkbox that say we took the training, but we don't buy into that. And so wow. the metrics, you know, didn't mean anything because it was just credenza wear because we had to do it. We just did it. Um, and now working at, at 337, I'm looking across the industry, seeing how metrics are used. Um, I did an impromptu poll on LinkedIn about 70 people responding where all I asked was, do you use metrics, yes or no? About 80% uh -huh. of respondents said, yes, we use them. And I asked them to give me some examples, both privately or just post it uh, in the comments. And it was things like number of alarms or uptime mm -hmm. of systems or um, number of visitors, number of badges distributed. Uh, and it was really interesting to me because I look at all those and say, well, what is that? 
what are you learning from that? What are you gaining? What's the outcome? What's the objective? And so, you know, that, that's kind of like a, um, a little bit of history and a little bit of, of the background on like my thoughts and perspectives. And why this is so intriguing to me is because, um, you know, in my perspective, you can't meet an objective unless you're measuring it. And then your, your objective has to be meaningful for your business, for your operation. And I think I get the, you know, my, my hypothesis is that we don't really do this well across the security industry, whether it's uh, integrator, manufacturer, end user, consultant, you know, there's not really, a, you know, a, a methodology that gets applied either individually or universally. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to take the industry to another level if we took a closer look at this topic. Yeah, I, and I 100 percent agree. I mean, there's um, is it is it was it like the father six sigma? I think that said, and I don't remember his name offhand, but like what gets measured gets improved, right? And so in our industry, since we grow, I'm mean, just just popped into my head as you were speaking. You know, we we've grown, I think, some in the low teen percentages every year since the 70s. So if we're growing, right, we we must be doing everything right. So I therefore, why, why should we look to improve? What, what measures could possibly tell us how to get better? And so that's a, it's an interesting thing. You know, I, and I, I don't know if that's out of arrogance, but I know there's a, or not, not no, arrogance, but complacency maybe is a better word, um, from across the industry, you know, that we have not pursued metrics to gauge the performance that we have and look for places that we could improve. I've seen um Access control comes to mind like throughput, right? Because there were definitely bad experiments. I don't know if they were experiments, bad projects where, you know, not enough doors to get, you know, 3,000 people into a, a high rise, you know, in the 20 minutes before they had to all be at their desks, right? So there were problems like that early on in the industry that were, you know, so throughput for access control became sort of a known metric and need, needing to understand how many lanes I was going to need to enable uh, the, the workforce that shows up you know, 20 minutes before it has to be at work or whatever. Um, but downtime, you talked a little bit about that, you know, so device downtime. I remember when we used to advertise, you know, five, nine uptime, blah, blah, blah. That was all the failover days, SQL and Legato before that, all, all those types of things. But these are fairly archaic, right? None of them mm -hmm. are sort of leading indicators for how we can improve um, our industry. So what, uh, from what you've seen, or maybe some of the comments that you got, what do you think kind of leading indicators we could look at? What are some things we could measure for how we're getting better? I mean, crime stats don't necessarily reflect what we do. You know, maybe, maybe a piece of it does. Yeah, I think, so where I would start is understanding, and, and this is why I think it's so challenging because if you looked across even like a, an, an industry and you looked at different types of operations, so you looked at, let's say like, you know, We'll, we'll use the aerospace industry because I'm familiar with it. You have Boeing, you have Lockheed Martin, you have uh, Raytheon, and you take their, you know, 10 of their sites at each one. And you say, all right, we're going to do a benchmarking exercise between your security operations across those three. Um, if, so like the site that I'm, that was my headquarters, which is here in, in, in Minnesota, South Minneapolis, um, we had something like 5,000 people maybe in the building. We had three buildings at any given time um, with two entrances. And we made that work. And, wow. and, so, and, 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 and so we looked at that and said, all right, our, and so we looked at what's the key process? What's our key objective for security, physical security at that, at that building? Um, that everyone who's supposed to get in gets in when they're supposed to get in, period. Right. Right. So that's what we want to measure is our people who are supposed to get an authorized personnel getting in on time and to where they need to be. And okay. so so then you start there and you work back and say, well, what does that what does that look like? If they're a visitor, they have to get registered and processed effectively and efficiently. If they're an employee, their badge has to work. If um, if they're a contractor, they're registered, pre-registered, they're in the system or we can register them effectively and efficiently. So you take that and you build your security program technology and metrics off of that. So you gotcha. also have to measure your turnbacks. Turnbacks being when the thing you want to happen doesn't happen. So when the visitor isn't pre-registered, well, the employee forgot. So the way I looked at it is that was my problem. 
because my security department didn't educate that person enough or give them enough knowledge to know mm. that that person needed to be registered ahead of time. Turn back for me. I have to go address that. How do I get better the next time? So taking that approach and having to distill it down to like almost a operational level, and then you may have another building that is smaller, but because of the disbursement of the parking lots, they have to have five entrances versus two. And they could have mm. half the population. So if you look at like, you know, well, we only want one entryway and we're going to have, you know, X many entry, you know, lanes per population. I think that's a fool's measure because it doesn't really indicate the operational effectiveness and efficiencies that need to be there based on what your key objective is. So that was my key objective. It doesn't mean it's everybody else's. If I'm an integrator, I could say I want, you know, 100% on time X, Y, Z. Um, like for instance, for, for the, um, a lot of manufacturing companies, it's 100% quality on time delivery. Those are their yeah. metrics that they use. Okay. Those are easy. I get it there when I say I'm going to get it there and it works just like it's supposed to work. You can apply those same metrics to an integrator that says I install it. It works. You're trained. And I don't have to come back for the first 30 days. Something like that might be an effective metric to say it works, how it's supposed to work, when it's supposed to work, and it works that way for a good extended period of time. Um, so so th that's how I articulate it. That's why I think it is a bit bespoke, but there's some concepts and principles that I think could be applied universally. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm looking at DHS's reference guide, and they're, they, they talk about, first of all, you've got this asset inventory, right? So you've got to you've got to have a picture of the assets it takes to do all those things that you mentioned. You know, you've got visitor management, you've got access control for the um, the regular people, you've got a guest registration type system, you perhaps mm -hmm. have guards. So you've got an asset of stuff that needs to be operational. And then of course, the people that operationalize it, um, which they list as like resource requirements. And they kind of right. looked at measuring how many FTEs does it take to get it done as another sort of an input to the, to the process of, of, of measurement. Um, and then uh, they also listed like countermeasures. So how many types of countermeasures are in place, right? So if you, if I don't have it to your point, if you had the one place that had only the two doors um, and maybe because it's, it's smaller, there's less surveillance on the parking lot where the other place had a larger parking lot. So I'm using surveillance over there. What type of incidents do I get and what volume of incidents, incidents do I get? And, you know, are those countermeasures effective or were they effectively deployed, you know, versus the other facility? And I know DHS has to look across, you know, all the facilities on mm -hmm. all the critical infrastructure and try to find a comparative value there. But as a metric, these are interesting ideas for operationalizing security um, in an environment. Um, what, where does it, at what level do you think it begins to mature for an organization? How many, how many metrics do they need to have that are, you know, valuable in guiding decision-making processes when they can say, hey, we're, we're getting pretty good at, at leaning in to our, to our business. Yeah. Well, I, I would apply the, um, the continuous improvement principles and say okay. that, you know, you're, you're never done um, ah. because you're, you're, you're changing your baseline based on the environment around you and you, there's internal and external factors. So let me double tap on that a second. If before COVID you had mature processes and you knew how everything operated, when COVID happened, you need to reassess everything because your baseline has just adjusted. And so now you're reapplying because you don't have anybody in your building anymore. So tracking visitors is an irrelevant statistic because it doesn't matter. Um, and now you've changed. And when, we, uh, when, you're, when your company adjusts again to whatever it's going to be in the future, which is maybe a hybrid situation or something completely different, you now have to reassess your situation both internally and mm -hmm. externally. Um, so did the environment around you. So take downtown Minneapolis for, for uh, an example. Um, last summer, actually a year ago today, I believe, when you had the uh, oh, yeah. George Floyd and all the things that happened downtown, we had a pandemic, social unrest and rioting all happening at once. Tell me one person or company that had that plan slotted <laughs> out. Nobody. I bet they yeah. all do now, though. And that's yeah. where the nimbleness has to come into play around how you adjust to that. So, um, so there, there's a framework that has been popularized in the last you know, 10 years or so, um, but it's been around for a while, the Enterprise Security Risk Management or ESRM. And it uses the continuous improvement framework that basically you, you uh, take external internal data points, you, you kind of put them into your assessment protocol, 
you see if they change any of your processes, procedures, or protocols. And if they don't, then you're good and you continue on. If they do, you readjust um, and then reassess, and it's a continuous loop. Um, but the starting point for me is to really understand what your key processes are. Uh, and the way that I did it previously is we had a maturity matrix of um, uh, where we would, there were certain components, and this is right out of like the Six Sigma, Six Sigma operating protocol and, and lean operation um, principles. And you mature your processes, you know, up and to the right. And when you get to a certain level, you know that this is a mature process. I, mean, I can track it. I know the inputs. I know the outputs. I have all the metrics around it. Um, and then you have other processes that now you say, okay, I need to mature those. So that means I'm, I'm I can I track it? Um, do I have all the inputs and outputs? Uh, and for me, from a end user perspective, from a security practitioner, it's what what value did I produce to the operation? What do I do? Or if the, well, the question I would pose to to myself to colleagues is, what process do we do? Or if we didn't do it would have direct impact on the business that would impact its ability to operate. So for me, going back to the example of the right people getting in the building when they were supposed to and getting where they're supposed to be, if people can't get to the production line, they can't make our products, we can't make our products, we can't ship them, we don't make money, company ceases to exist. So those are the kind of threads that we pull through to say, how do we directly impact or support the business? The same thing around collection of situational awareness and business intelligence? Are we taking that and delivering it to anybody to make actionable activities? Like for, if there's a tornado warning that's going to impact one of our sites, do we give them enough heads up where they can be safe or move assets out of the way so they're not impacted or go into some sort of protective lockdown? Um, you know, thing, things like that. So you know, knowing what your processes are, knowing what the impact is on the business or the operation, and then continuously assessing uh, and improving, uh, you know, kind of exponentially, right? The job's never done. Nice, nice. Okay, cool. Well, we're get, we're gonna pay some bills. Uh, we're talking security metrics with Jonathan Harris. I want to get into some of these output measures and a little more continuous improvement when we get back. Stick around. Sixty seconds. We'll see you. Hey, we're back. Welcome back to Security Matters. We are talking about security metrics, and Jonathan Harris has a great history um, of, of, of looking at this from a manufacturer's lens and then from a security lens within that environment, and then looking at it across the industry. So we were kind of kicking around input measures, and we ultimately got to this idea of continuous improvement. Because when you get one piece of an organization, you know, operating well, mature, it, it, it probably um, it, it's as effective as it can be, or, or maybe spending more money to improve it a couple points really isn't valuable to the, to the organization. There's, a, there's maybe a maximum efficiency or something like that that can be obtained in, in each area. But so you'll take your resources and go look at another area that needs improvement. Maybe it's scoring a D, you want to get all, all processes up to a B or, or an A, or I think six sigmas. I don't remember if that's five nines or what the ultimate, ultimate measure is. But um, uh, uh, DHS, I was looking at some of the ways they measure these things. And when they get to the out, outputs, um, they really look at things like um, how many of the facilities have they assessed completely? Um, what are the, what's the acceptable level of risk for each organization, right? So if you look, think about all the facilities they're responsible for across the country, you know, if you've got facilities that are at a, you know, a 60% 
uh, risk level and others that are 95% protected, well, you want to go work on those ones that are at 60%. If they're, you know, the closer they are to shutting down the economy or shutting down national security, um, those types of risks get elevated for them. Um, they have some other interesting things around countermeasures, you know, the number that are deployed, um, the number that are needed, you know, is there a backlog of deployment? Um, how many have they tested and how frequently? Um, and what's the response time to a, a problem? These are kind of like kind of things we'd all would like to know about our facilities. And like from an end user perspective, um, the kind of things maybe people could bring into their operations. Um, you could definitely download this if you just Google um, Homeland Security uh, uh, risk measures, uh, you, you can find this document. And I thought it was kind of interesting. And they ultimately get to like stakeholder satisfaction and things mm -hmm. like that, right? Which is kind of the, the end user satisfaction when you ask the integrator, hey, you gave me all this stuff, what's it doing for me? You should have some metrics to back up your answer maybe. Yeah, hundred percent. I think so. <laughs> we'll take that in 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 kind of two chunks there. So the the one thing that I would be cautious of uh, with some of those metrics that DHS lists off is just is just kind of vanity metrics. So yeah, like hey, we got you know ten sites, we assessed eight, we're good. Well, what 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 did you assess? How did you assess it? How did you choose those? So. You know, a lot of times what, what I would do when I was working for a couple of years um, as a security consultant working for enter with enterprise companies, specifically looking on, um, looking at this kind of thing, doing enterprise-wide physical security risk assessments, we would look at their whole operation and say, tell me the sites that if they shut down would destroy your company. We start there. And then we say, all right, let's rank them by business impact. And then let's try to take a, a cross representation because we can't go look at all hundred. So maybe we're going to say we're going to do ten percent. We'll look at all the your maybe we'll do your your your, your top ten, and then we'll take ten percent representation across your others. So we will go look mm. at one little sales office. We will go look at a couple of small plants. We'll go look at an R and D facility and some other things, and we'll use that to try to extrapolate an effective representation of your entire risk profile. Um, okay. But we'll really make sure we go look at those ten that if one of them shut down. Like it's catastrophic to your business. And then really applying, you know, and you could go back to the old Carver methodology of, of, of risk assessment um, or just looking at the, the probability and likelihood and impact, right? Mm -hmm. So the kind of that, that you know, X, Y scale of, you know, it, what's the likelihood of it happening and what's the, it, the business or operational impact if it does happen? And, and looking at everything through those lens uh, and then driving your metrics off of that. So if you just say we, we assess, you know, 10% last year, we want to get to 40% this year. Like, does that really mean anything if you haven't done uh, some of that asset work that you talked about when you went and looked at what's the most important stuff? When um, I, I was, uh, w w was a subcontractor to the U.S. government, and they would require us to do what they called a crown jewels assessment. So whether it was our facilities that were working on classified programs or not, they would say, you do enough work with the government and your critical infrastructure and you do things for certain other sectors that are critical to the U.S. government um, uh, kind of economy, uh, yeah. you know, writ large. So we want to help you protect your information. So go look at what's the IP or what's the information that you have, or even that one engineer, right? You might have that really smart engineer who's the best at what they do in the world. And maybe other companies, maybe other adversaries and other you know, nation states are going to try to you know, get into this person to extrapolate information that could cost you as a business and, frankly, impact uh, you know, the national security efforts as well. Um, so there's a lot to that, a lot to unpack. But that, that's just to say that just, just to say assessment, yes or no, is probably not detailed enough unless you have that information behind it that said, we went through this rigor and this methodology to pick the ones that we did. We did this many, and we're going to reassess next year, make sure that nothing moved up and down the list, and then we'll continue on with our assessment protocol. Um, on the integrator side or the service provider side, just like you said, you know, it, it's the same thing where those customer um, satisfaction metrics, and I even I would even argue that at the end user that we need, to, we need to see ourselves as service organizations and that mm -hmm. we're providing a service. And so we should be getting those customer satisfaction. That, that's a part of our the, the Six Sigma and 
lean operating process is getting customer feedback and doing uh, mm-hmm. you know market feedback analysis. I'm providing you this service. How am I doing? Am I meeting you know your uh, your expectations? And so, if we as service providers in the security industry aren't asking our clients how am I doing and waiting to say, oh man, they just ripped us out and replaced us with a different technology. We should have paid better attention. You know, let all good. Let's go chase down another logo and we'll we'll work really hard and spend millions of dollars to get new customers when we could just focus on the customers that we have. If we ask them how we're performing, how are we doing, how can we get better? And so I think that's a huge area where customer retention metrics could be uh, with, with like other parts of our, like adjacent industries, like SaaS companies and IT companies look at uh, customer churn and, and it's a little bit easier for them to observe it because if I'm providing you a service like Netflix, Netflix can tell you every day how many people canceled and how many new subscribers they've had. So they use that as a ratio, their CAC ratio of, of you know, what are their customer acquisition costs, what's their customer churn, how many new are acquired, and they have this ratio that they have for how much they're spending on new and how much they're retaining. I've never heard of a security company in our industry that focuses on, on that concept um, to, the, to the level, to the extent that I could ask you, how much, what's your CAC ratio? How much money does it cost you to bring on a new client? And then how much do you, you know, where's your break even point? How long do you have to keep them on before now you're making money on that client? And then what's your plan to retain them over time um, and continue to grow them? Um, you know, it seems like we focus on new client, new customer acquisition, new logos, and that's all we want to do. Um, and I think that's something right away that we could be measuring better than actioning mm. and, and really, you know, helping companies mature and keep good customers as opposed to just chasing new ones. Yeah, I, 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 I definitely agree with you that engaging our clients from, from the integrator perspective, I think the alarm guys are better at kind of doing, you know, what you're talking about, tracking mm-hmm. some of the, the cost of acquisition and that, but integrators in particular, if we're not engaging our customer in the value of continuous improvement and making sure that they understand our role in that and their role in that for their organization and for the people that they're protecting that work for them, you know, if we can't get that kind of agreement early on that that's the role that we play and have a partnership that works towards continuous improvement, you know, they were just showing up at the door every year trying to upgrade you to the latest widgets and blend. that's how we look, you know, it's too transactional. Yeah. And we, yeah. so they want, they definitely want more value from us. And we owe that to, to the industry. We owe that to our customers. We owe that to the country realistically as security service people. Um, and as we pivot Scott, to, go ahead. to real quick on that, like, you know, the, the buzzword in our industry from an integrated perspective is the reoccurring revenue model, right? We, we want yeah. that RMR. Those things come piece and parcel, right? If you want me to continue to pay you for reoccurring service, there needs to be a ratio of service cost and value. Yeah. And, and value needs to go up, right? Because I'm going to look at that bill every month, just like I do. I use a Netflix example. I look at it. Do I still get $19.95 out of value from a Netflix? Yep, I'm keeping it, right? So that's that's an assessment that we're doing every time we get that bill. Yeah, uh, is the value there? And and so I think that's the concept that we need to embed in order to make that work. I love it. I love it. We got a minute or so left. Final comment. What do you do to uh, motivate this industry to get better? <laughs> yeah, I think I think for us it's just you know um, breaking away from the way it's always been done as an you know as as an excuse to keep continue to do it that way that there's other industries adjacent to us that that have applied new methodologies and and it's okay to try new stuff fail quickly at it and learn from it and i think that's what we can learn from software companies technology companies and and embrace that and i think the companies that do that will will move fast and and move past other companies that don't em- embrace that i think us as security professionals also need to embrace that end users need to get a little bit more comfortable with the new. And I, and I do feel that um, the pandemic for all the challenges and catastrophe that it has caused has expedited that component of it. And so there is this silver lining around this otherwise disastrous cloud that has pushed us forward uh, outside of our comfort zones and embracing the new and embracing the change. Yeah. Difficulty and difficult times can bring about great change. So I do, I do look forward to seeing that happen. Jonathan, thank you so much for your time and your insights today. Appreciate you jumping in at the last minute for this episode. We will do it again, sir. Thanks a yeah. lot. Everybody take care out there. Aloha.